Hey everybody and welcome to this week's live stream. I'm in a different setting today if you can't tell if you're a regular viewer, um, which I'll talk about in a second, but hello and welcome and thank you for being here. Um, how's everybody on this fine Thursday? Let me get the chat up here. Uh, if you're new to my channel, welcome. I'm Emily. I play the cello. I specialize in Baroque music and historical performance, and I do these live streams every Thursday here on YouTube with a different theme, a different topic. I'm really excited about today's topic because I think it's going to be super useful for classical musicians. If you're just a fan who watches me and just enjoys classical music, this will not be as relevant to you in your life, but I actually would love to have you contribute to this conversation, and I'll get into all of that also. Um, yeah, no TV and birds today. I am in a different room, unfortunately, because um, they are doing construction on my building. So I'm going to have to see about the live streams just because, of course, construction noise is very loud. We may still hear a bit of it during this stream today, but at least it's just talking. I knew for myself if I did a performance live stream where I was playing a lot, the construction was going to be way too distracting for me. Um, and it is a little bit quieter back here in this room. So fingers crossed today will be fine. I am going to have to see what I'm going to do moving forward because this construction is ongoing. I live in California and they have to earthquake, re-earthquake proof our building, which is apparently something that has to happen on a regular basis or somewhat regular basis. Um, so it just has to happen. So I'm doing my best to make it work. I'm obviously not in control of the noise, but... Um, so here we are in a different setting, but I still did bring my cello into the room so that we at least had one instrument in here. So uh, let me fix up a couple other things here so that I'm really with you guys. Uh, thank you all for being here. So um, I took last week off, if you didn't notice, I did announce it on my social media. I had been doing weekly live streams for I think eight weeks in a row, uh, which was awesome. And really for the bulk of the, when the whole quarantine thing really started, I was showing up every week and that was great. Last week I kind of felt like I needed a week off of the stream. So I took last week off, but the week prior was the second part of the 17th century solo bass music or solo cello music in the case of what I was doing. Um, so we have done now two different live streams all about 17th century solo repertoire for bass instruments, which is, I think, probably my favorite repertoire. So fun to talk about some of the performance approaches and just getting to know the music since so much of it is kind of obscure. So we've had those two parts of the 17th century music. We've had talking topics about social media and technology for musicians, um, some of the starter points for learning about how to play in the Baroque style, We've done some other performance streams of me playing duets with myself, both early classical and Baroque. We've done just solo repertoire with a mix of Bach cello suites, 17th century music, and some later 18th century unaccompanied cello music. So in the last eight or nine weeks, we have really covered a lot of stuff on these live streams and I'm loving it. And I really appreciate getting all of your guys' suggestions and input that really helps drive what I'm doing. So I really appreciate that so much. Um, hello everybody, I'm just taking a look at the chat now, and yes, I love that you guys are active in the chat. Please continue to do so, and I'll be checking in with it as much as I can. Um, so, uh, oh, I didn't realize that Yo-Yo Ma is doing the Bach Cello Suites live on YouTube, but I would love to see that. Yo-Yo Ma has really been showing up for us uh, with all the crises. I've seen a couple of his posts that have been shared around since all this stuff. And he's a really wonderful guy. Like he's just such a good hearted person and he's the exact kind of person we need, like bringing healing classical music to the masses during a time like this. So yeah, I, I will totally tune in and watch him. Um, so today's topic. So I have been here on YouTube for a long time now. I've been really regularly posting on YouTube for the last five years or so, a couple videos a month, um, though I have had my channel for many years more than that. And I have been doing so much of my classical, classical career using online methods and technology and the internet and social media. I've always gravitated towards that stuff. So once I was finishing up my schooling and ready to start my career, it was just natural to me to want to put myself out there online. So that's what I've done. But I've actually been able to build a very nice little career around my online endeavors and making money off of them. So I want to share some of the things that I've learned and that I've done um, to make music as a classical musician online. And I know if I'm just talking to some of you guys who are just my fans and supporters, 
obviously these tips and stuff, they don't apply to you. You're not trying to make money off of classical music. But I would love your contribution because a lot of you guys who watch me, subscribe to me, or are part of my Patreon or donate, um, I would love to hear from you guys in the chat, and I'm sure our viewers would too, about why you decide to pledge my Patreon or send me a donation. What moves you to do that? Because that's kind of what we're going to be talking about here, giving people advice, other classical musicians who want to put themselves out there, what's a way that they can do that and actually get some return on investment. So. Um, I really do welcome anyone who wants to say, oh, I donate to you because I find this really informative or I appreciate this and this about what you do. Because um, it's great for me to know that stuff, but also for everybody else for the sake of this discussion. So I got a couple talking points. I'm just going to kind of talk about things openly. I will, of course, be taking your questions and kind of all questions are OK for today. But if they're in the topic of the stream, even better. Um, so let's see here. So now we are getting into the content of today's stream. So I think I'm calling this how to monetize your work as a classical musician or something like that. So before I get into a couple of the main different ways that you can monetize, um, which there are definitely a couple different ways you can approach it, um, or you can do multiple, which I have done also, uh, it's really important to first understand the concept of building your audience. So Who's going to donate to you if you do not have an audience yet? Of course, you know, friends and family are always an option, but just I, I personally don't like to rely on like my own colleagues, my own family, my own friends for support. I understand that sometimes they are going to support us and that's great and wonderful and we should encourage that. But the idea is to sort of take it a little bit beyond just, uh, you know, what our own little inner circle can provide for us. So you have to build your audience first to even have people who want to donate to you or give you money or support your projects. So there's a lot of things you can do to build your audience. But the most important thing is putting out content in a place that people can find. And I won't get into all the nitty gritty of how to use social media because that's kind of its own topic. But putting content and in this situation I would call content you play music though it could also be something like a photo of something music related with a post that you write that has some good information for people or has a nice message just something that gives people something you know not looking to take but providing something what usually that's going to be music and I've said this a lot before but as classical musicians we are very trained and not everybody gets the luxury to hear a classical musician play an instrument. That's not something that every person in our country or especially in our world gets to experience. So already we have something very valuable to offer people just by playing our music. So that's it's important to know that just sharing your music is content and is value. Unfortunately, there are many barriers for classical musicians who are afraid to put their playing out or think it has to be perfect or think it isn't professional enough. There's so many ways that we block ourselves from sharing what is such a great thing to share with people. So by you will build your audience by putting your content out there, whether you do that on YouTube, on Instagram, on Facebook, there are so many avenues of how you can get your music out there, but you have to start with putting yourself out there and just building your audience and your following first. I see this mistake a lot of people trying to get money or donations or whatever it is before they've really established some sort of foundation of what they're doing. Uh, thank you, Bill, so much for your super chat. Um, and uh, I know I have donations activated for this stream. There's certainly no pressure to donate. It's like almost kind of awkward to be talking about donating and asking for donations at the same time. Like I definitely want to just acknowledge that that's like kind of a little bit weird, but um, I'm just open to talk about all of it. I'm not someone who's weird about talking about money stuff. I think it's something we should all be a little bit more comfortable talking about. So um, where was I there? So. First, you have to build your audience. I see people looking for money and support before they they really have a core group of, or any amount of people supporting them. And it's just so important that you, you put yourself out there so that people can know you're providing something of value. You can't look to be, you know, as freelancers, we know what it's like. We usually have to work before we get our money. I mean, I guess everybody kind of does, but especially for us, it's like we gotta do the gig and play the concert and then wait for the check, or, you know, sometimes we get the check at the last minute. So we're not 
unfamiliar with the concept of having to do a little work before we get any return. And I do think that's really important because if we put ourselves out there to the world and first start presenting ourselves and our main message is donate, 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 it's not usually a turn on for people. We have to show people that we have something to offer whether they donate or not. And that's why I do always say on my streams, I so appreciate the donations. They really do mean a lot to me. It's not like, you know, I'm a freelance musician. It's not like I'm rolling in the dough. Like donations matter to me. They make a big difference in my life. I'm so grateful for them. But I'm not going to be resentful if I do a live stream and nobody donates or I do anything and nobody donates. Um, we shouldn't have this desperate attitude that people need to be giving us money or they should, if they're enjoying our music, they should be giving us money. We need to have a gracious attitude to begin with of sharing our music because lots of people are sharing their music completely for free and not asking for donations. Maybe they have a day job, maybe who knows what their financial situation is, but for whatever reason, they're not pushing donations, but their music is still there to be enjoyed. So if you're too obnoxious with expecting money or expecting money before there's even anybody there to give it to you, then uh, you're distracting from what your real value is that you're bringing, which is your music, your expertise, your knowledge. Provide that for people. Make them want to pay for it. Make them see the value so that they feel inclined to donate rather than probing people too much. I do think it's important to make it very easy and obvious how to donate, as I do on all my streams. I always mention it verbally. I always have the links everywhere. You want to make it very easy so that if people feel compelled to donate, they don't have to jump through hoops to do it. That is very important, but it can't be all about that. Now, we are going to talk about the different ways to monetize, which some are a little bit more pressurized, things like fundraisers, which we'll get into. But really, the first step is building your audience finding people who just like what you're doing. And yes, you can have a donation link or you can, you know, mention that, but don't let it be the thing you're blasting to everybody because the point should be sharing your art and then you're getting sponsored or thanked for doing so through the donations. It's not the same to me as teaching a private lesson where there's an agreed upon rate and an agreed upon exchange you give me this money and I will teach you these lessons right now. Like that's an agreement. But for donations and things like putting up your performances, it's a little bit more gray. So be okay with however people take your content in. People enjoying your music is just as valuable as people donating. And as more and more people enjoy your music, that will grow your following and eventually you will have people who want to donate or are able to donate more. Don't discount people who just watch and enjoy but don't donate is what I want to say because they're all a part of your community and you want to be building a community that supports your music. Whether it just shouldn't be all about like specific dollar sign things. Remember that you are providing something to inspire people to want to give you money, not, I am doing this to get money, if that makes sense. Um, let me just look over here at the chat, okay. Um, so that was the first big point, is building your audience and then also creating something of value. So I can talk a little bit more just about what is value. I mean, like I already said, I believe that um, as classical musicians, trained ones you know we already have value inherent value any musician has inherent we all have if we want to get really big picture we all have inherent value in all different ways but any musician has a gift to share with people the gift of music so then you add classical musician someone who's very trained very knowledgeable has high technical proficiency um naturally you will just impress people when you play a classical instrument so the, the value's already there. So then what it comes down to for most classical musicians is what is the piece of content you're creating, whether it's a video of you playing, and that can be a fancy video that you spend a lot of time editing, or it can be a video you shoot on your phone and do one take and post. It's not necessarily, that doesn't measure the value. You never know what's gonna click with people, what's gonna move them. So the important thing is that you're putting yourself out there regularly, sharing your music, and let us not forget that being vulnerable is one of the best ways to connect with people. And in classical music, we really like to act like vulnerability doesn't exist. <laughs> we kind of all have to like get rid of our vulnerability just to survive our schooling. But when it comes to uh, connecting with an audience, and I talk about this topic all the time, um, when it comes, 
sorry, Bill, I read your question and then I completely lost my train of thought. So let me just answer your question. So Bill asks, um, it seems like I am diverse. Maybe I can speak to the value of diversity to make a living. And yes, diversity is very important. I mean, I'll say right away, just doing social media techie stuff is a separate skill set than my classical musician skills. So already that's some diversity in my skills that has really served my career. And I do think all musicians should be encouraged to develop some other kind of skill set that can support your career, whether it's great writing and then you can always write your own program notes. Or obviously this technology stuff is very relevant for today and for the current world crisis. So learning different types of technology, both in recording equipment and then also um, more like internet, social media type stuff is very useful. Um, but when it comes to your music, it really can be anything. It's more about how you get it out there than it is about what it is you're playing. You'll find as you share more of your playing, people responding more to certain things and less to others. I think at some point, you know, I made the observation, okay, Bach cello suites always perform well, you know, in metrics or analytics because people love the Bach cello suites, people are searching for it and so on. So you will learn those things along the way um, but you don't have to feel like you should only play repertoire that's popular, or that people are going to like, or that's modern. You can play anything. It's more about you being yourself and putting your music out there and doing it regularly. Again, you can't put out one thing and expect the world to change. You have to show up on a regular basis and share yourself all the time because you can't count on one thing to bring people in. In fact, if you're constantly creating new pieces of content, again, be that videos or photos related to music with a meaningful caption, like a little blog post or something, as long as you're creating something on a regular basis, each time you create that thing, there's more opportunities for people to find you, for people to connect with you, and then your audience builds, and then suddenly you have this subset of people that you can start to quote unquote advertise to. We're not really advertising, but just looking for additional support. But you got to get those people there first. Um, someone asks, uh, oh, grant writing. That is something that is a very useful skill. Absolutely. That I never learned. And so therefore I was very, I never got any grants because I could not do grant writing. Um, but especially in classical music, absolutely. That's a great skill to have. Um, Someone asks, have you considered platforms like Twitch? Uh, viewers are more used to donating there. Yeah, so um, I've used Twitch myself for my other music project, Wishlist, in the past, actually before when it had a different name. Um, I have not done it for cello specifically because I like to have my main hub be YouTube. Twitch is a platform really you know, designed just for live streaming. So if people find me on Twitch and they follow my streams, that's great because then they would follow my streams, but they wouldn't have any of my other content like my pre-recorded videos, which is so much of the meat of my channel are all these like educational videos that I've made and uh, recorded videos that I've made. So I don't move to Twitch because I would like to funnel all my traffic into my YouTube. But if someone is specifically interested in just live streaming, I do think Twitch is a great place to explore. I haven't done enough of it side by side with YouTube to really measure which is more successful. Um, but I will say, yes, Twitch is more set up for donations. And I think there's a little bit more organic discovery on Twitch. So if you don't have a big following, I think it's a little bit easier to maybe get found on Twitch, whereas on YouTube, that can be a little more difficult. So they're just different platforms with different benefits. Um, but let's see here. So um, let's go into some of the different ways that you can monetize your music now that we've kind of talked more big picture about um, what's sort of needed to expect money from people. So a lot of people know that I have had a Patreon campaign for this YouTube channel for many years. Like I think I'm on five years now. And a lot of people know about Patreon by this point, but if you don't, basically it's uh, it's donations, but it's subscription based. So that just means it's recurring payments. So instead of someone like donating $10 to your fundraiser, they um, pledge a certain amount. Oftentimes it's a smaller amount, like a dollar, three dollars, five dollars, and they get charged that amount on a regular schedule. And as a, as a creator on Patreon, you decide what that schedule is. It can be every time you upload something new. So that's what I do because I upload a few videos a month. So every time I upload a new video or a new live stream like this, 
my patrons get charged for it. They get charged for every piece of content that I put on my YouTube channel. And I make sure to never do more than one a week so I don't overcharge them and they have an idea of what to expect. Um, another option for Patreon is just a monthly amount so people can pledge $3 and just give you $3 a month and then you get a bunch of people to do that and you're making a monthly amount. Now, Patreon doesn't exist for nothing. You don't have a Patreon for existing. <laughs> my Patreon was specific to my YouTube uploads. So I launched the Patreon when I already had my YouTube channel. I think I was just under a thousand subscribers at that time. So I had built up a couple hundred subscribers to my channel from just putting videos out and putting myself out there. And I wasn't doing it with any real regularity or structure, but I had put out enough things that people had subscribed to me. So when I launched the Patreon, I decided I am now gonna make a weekly video and I'm making this Patreon if you wanna support my weekly videos. And it started small with, you know, maybe I was making $20 a video, but I was putting out four a week, so that was adding up. And it is important for your patrons and everyone who pledges to understand if you're going to be charging them multiple times a month, so I tried to make that really clear. But the great thing about that model was that it was also putting a little pressure on me to deliver every week and make sure I was showing up every week with a new video. And that's how I built pretty much all the good content on this YouTube channel came from when I launched my Patreon and decided to commit to weekly, uh, and those were weekly recorded videos, not live streams. Uh, Cause that was five years ago, live streams weren't as much of a thing back then. Um, so it was actually good cause it gave me some accountability and it gave me a little bit of reward um, each time. And the Patreon grew really fast because with every new video I was putting out, I was saying at the end, check out my Patreon. I now have people supporting me on Patreon for these videos if you like the videos, check it out. And every single video I said that, and of course it was not the first thing I said, I didn't lead with that, I led with whatever the content was on the video, but I made it clear and obvious that I had a Patreon. And before I knew it, especially with the regular uploads and the regular mentioning of the Patreon, I had a great sizable amount of people on my Patreon pledging for my videos every single month. Um, so that was really the model that gave me the most out of all my YouTube stuff. So I do recommend Patreon, but it requires a commitment. Like you have to be ready to commit to some sort of schedule of what you're gonna be putting out there. So it might not be a good first step unless you're just like a project-based person and you wanna make a little project for yourself and you're gonna to commit to it and you're gonna launch the Patreon. Um, but it is a really cool model if you are committed to doing regular content. Um, so then, uh, oh, and I was going to say pros and cons for all of these. I'm kind of still saying the pros and cons, but I'll outline it a little bit more. Um, I would say the pros of Patreon are that it's a great for community building. I mean, you have this like little subset of people that are your people, that are your patrons, that are, you know, want to be there supporting your work. So the community sense is really good. You send them when you, like, obviously my YouTube videos are public. Anyone can see them. So my patrons are just getting emailed the YouTube link when I put the video out, but I write them a special note that's just for my patrons that talks a little bit about why I decided to do that video and maybe some fun facts, just some insider info. It makes people feel a little closer to your work, a little closer to you, and like they really are an important part of supporting you because they're getting this insider info. Um, I don't know how much my patrons all care about it. Some of them probably don't even read the emails. Some of them might love it, but it's just offering them a little something for their support. And you do, and this is true for fundraisers also, you do offer some rewards on Patreon. My rewards are nothing too crazy. I'm lucky enough that I have recorded albums in the past so I can give away digital copies of my albums as rewards. Um, I've also given like the audio from my videos. So like if I recorded a Bach video on my channel, if a patron wanted to, they could get the audio and listen to it like it's a recording if they wanted to. Or um, some of my higher pledge amounts, like once you get over $20 a video and stuff like that, um, offer even cooler benefits. Like some of them you can get a lesson with me or other stuff. So Patreon is a whole thing to explore if you're curious about that model. Um, but I would say it has a lot of pros with community building. I would say the cons is that it can be a little bit like a slow burn when you start. Um, it takes a while, especially if you don't already have an audience. And that's why if you focus on just building your audience first, when you add the fundraising monetization level, it'll go a lot better than if you try to start yourself off with monetization as your goal. Um, it doesn't mean it's not possible, but I do think that 
building your audience first is important. So Patreon can be a little slow in the beginning if you don't really have an audience. Um, and then another con, if you want to see it that way, is you have to be delivering regularly. I mean, Patreon, you're only going to get your patrons support if you're giving them what you say you're going to give them, whether it's for the month or for per creation is what Patreon calls it. So that's like per video. Um, so you have to be delivering too on your end, kind of a con. Um, Someone says, uh, I think yours was the first Patreon that I subscribed to. Well, thank you so much for doing that. And if you feel so inclined to share why you felt like you wanted to um, join my Patreon, I would love to hear it, mostly just because we're trying to talk about these topics. What makes someone want to give you money for what you're doing? Um, and just kind of taking the mystique out of that and just talking about it. So um, so that's that's it on Patreon. That was kind of a lot on that. Um, but they have, it has really supported my channel, and I will say, um, I guess, because it kind of goes with it, you can, of course, make money on YouTube just from views, because if you enable ads to be run on your videos, which I do, you will get money from that advertising. I will say, besides the fact that it's a very, very low amount, you have to be getting a lot of views for that to turn into any kind of money that looks like anything. I should have looked before this at like how many monthly views I get on this channel. I don't know. I couldn't tell you. I'm not obsessive about my stats. And because I care more about just the quality of the content that I'm giving and talking about the things that I think are important, I've never been stats driven with my channel. Um, other YouTube channels take different approaches. There's a lot of kind of like clickbaity or just... Uh, popular topics. There's a lot of ways you can explore if like your goal is to get as many views as possible and then maybe eventually you'll get a little bit of money from that. But with my channel now, um, I think I make maybe I make 30-ish, $35 off of ads. I have 12,000 subscribers and tons of videos but my view counts aren't crazy high because I have like obscure 17th century music. There's not that many people searching for it. So I don't think relying on like YouTube ad revenue is a really great method for classical musicians unless you want to do pop covers like on classical instruments and or you want to record like all the greatest classical pieces and do that really well. Like here's Pachelbel's Canon and here's whatever else um, and kind of like hunt to try to get views by doing really popular things. You know, that is something that can be tried. I always wanted to do my more niche specific topics, so it just didn't work for me to count on ad revenue from YouTube. So that's why the Patreon was so useful because that was people, you know, giving me a real dollar amount per video that added up. So yes, ad revenue is possible. Personally for classical music, I wouldn't really recommend it. There's just not enough people searching for it for those numbers to add up in a meaningful way. So let's move on now to another possible source of income for classical musicians online. And that is fundraisers. So, and this is what we see most often, like GoFundMe is what I've used because um, you don't have to meet your goal. Like it's much more open-ended. Kickstarter, you have to reach your goal or else I think like everyone gets refunded. I don't know, I've actually never done Kickstarter, but I remember that used to be a thing. So for a fundraiser, which is of course a way to still get money for your projects, you obviously need a very specific project and likely one that is much larger scale than just like putting out a YouTube video. Though of course if you had like a whole YouTube series planned or something like that, you were gonna release a big body of work, you could probably do a fundraiser for that. I have done GoFundMe fundraisers for a few different things um, and they were all successful. One of them, the most recent, was my duo album with my friend Laura Rubenstein Salzedo. She's an amazing Baroque violinist and one of my closest friends. We played together and did a little album two years ago at this point. Yeah, two years ago. And so we did a GoFundMe basically to cover her travel, pay her for taking those couple days off that she had to come down to LA and record with me and paid me to do the mixing work. You know, just paid us enough that it felt like we could get rid of other work to do the work. Um, but it made sense because we were doing an album and every person who pledged got a copy of the album and stuff like that. So um, fundraisers work well for something like that. Um, and then in the past, I did a fundraiser when I moved to Los Angeles from Boston. I did a big fundraiser 
just to help me with moving costs. But what I did along with the fundraiser was I did a live streamed concert that was kind of just like my gift. Again, providing value, not just looking for money. I'm moving across the country. Give me money. I need it so bad. Like that should never be the way we ask for money. It should be, I am here to share what I have with the world. Here are my skills. Here is my value. And then we get the value back. We do have to ask for it. We do have to make it easy for people, but we have to also really lead with what we're offering people. I just think that's really important. Um, so, all right, I subscribe to your Patreon because of the content on your YouTube channel uh, and you don't remember how you found it. Well, that's good. I come up to, uh, there are certain searches. I think if you search Bach Cello Suite, one prelude sheet music on one of the first videos I have because I have a video of me playing with the manuscript. So there are certain search terms where I'm like one of the first results. So you probably searched one of those and that was how you found me. Um, you know, actually, um, with YouTube, uh, so we're, um, we're saying here that with 12,000 followers, probably more people would tune in live. It's very confusing with YouTube. It's true that probably a lot of people don't have notifications turned on, but also these are subscribers, like my 12,000 subscribers I have currently are from years and years, you know, some of these people could have died by now, not to be morbid, but just, you don't know when you've been accumulating subscribers over a lot of years, and then especially live stuff, like not everybody's available, not everybody enjoys live content, I think it's great for... I mean, I don't even want to say younger audience because I know that older people tune into my live streams and I so appreciate you guys. And I know that I have a very diverse, I actually would say probably my audience is on the older side just because that's classical music. Um, but live content isn't for everybody. It's like a little too informal, at least again, because we're dealing with a classical music audience. My audience here is of course classical music people um, who are a little more old school. So it's fine. And my... Um, my live streams always do get a couple hundred views shortly after they're over. So I know people are tuning in at different times and it's kind of, you know, they are all like an hour long and everyone has an hour to sit there and listen to me talk like I am right now. So um, it's totally fine. And again, that's why like, because I have Patreon supporting all these live streams, I'm not sweating how many people are tuning in, though I do see after the fact that hundreds of people watch them and People tell me how great they are or people donate to say thank you and I know that the value is there. So the emphasis doesn't have to be on just the dollar amounts or the subscriber amount or the view amount. It doesn't have to be about that, um, especially when you make it possible for people to donate. You could do something that doesn't get very many views, but you know, three people were very touched by it, so much so that they gave a very generous donation. And then it doesn't matter if 20 other people found it boring if three people were touched by it and felt compelled to support you. Um, so it's just kind of weighing all those factors and not letting anything, you know, throw you off too much. Um, oh, and thank you for the kind words about the album. That's actually a great segue to a little teaser that me and Laura might be making a little something for the channel. Nothing major, but maybe a little something for the channel from me and Laura because um, I love her playing and love to get some violin on the channel, so we'll have to stay tuned for that. Um, okay, Randy asks, um, what's your opinion about amateur classical musicians pursuing income by publishing on media? I've never considered this myself, but I'm thinking I put in the daily hours practicing. There is nothing wrong with asking for donations. I don't really like when people try to gatekeep that stuff, like, oh, you shouldn't get money for that because you're not legitimate enough by these arbitrary things that I decided. I think that's so dumb. You may find, you may do it and find, you know, maybe you do it a couple times and nobody donates and then you're like, eh, oh well, and then you stop. But there is no harm in trying, in, especially if you think it's possible. But I will just say like anything, it's a long game. Like I said, the audience building is a big part of if people are gonna wanna donate. I didn't just show up on the scene with my Baroque cello and start getting money. Like I had to just show up and play my instrument and do it and love it and learn and grow before anybody was giving me money. So um, I feel like in the situation of an amateur, it's like you want to know that you're committed 
or if your goal is donations, you know, you'll want to be committed long term to even see how that pans out. I think everybody has to be. But for an amateur, it might not be worth that commitment. That's just your own call to make. But for a professional, it's like you're in this for the long haul, hopefully. So you might as well start putting yourself out there. And if you have to keep on doing videos and recordings before anybody gives you anything, it's, you know, you got to keep doing it anyway because it's your job. Whereas an amateur, you know, if it puts pressure on you or it makes things stressful, you just want to weigh that out also because, of course, it's there for you for enjoyment and enrichment. So there's not as much financial pressure. Whereas, like, us classical musicians, it's such a poorly paid career, unfortunately. Even for the most successful ones in the game, it's just not the most lucrative. So we're all just, like, trying to survive, trying to pay off our very expensive loans from our education because we all had to get master's degrees to even be considered. So classical musicians, I know, we're very desperate to get a little money for all the work we've put into learning our instruments. Um, so, yeah, there are a lot of YouTubers selling personality alone. It's true, and I think there's a lot to be learned from people who, you know, get super fans and stuff from just being themselves. Because yeah, we are trying to connect with people as people. And it kind of goes back to my earlier point about vulnerability being the way that we connect with others. And classical music can be so rigid and we're expected to be perfect all the time or perfectly eloquent or perfectly whatever. And it's actually just creates more barriers, I find. Um, so we, we can learn a lot from, from people who are different than us. Who thought? Who would have thought? Um, Okay, let's get back to my list. So I was talking about fundraisers as a second option of ways to monetize. Patreon was my first example. Now we're on fundraisers, which as I was talking about are about like one big time goal. So some of the pros and cons, the pros is like it's one thing. It might be a larger, it should be a larger scoped project, but it's only one thing. You're not as committed. You're only committed to the length of that project where something like a Patreon or something like that, you're trying to commit for a longer period of time, like maybe a couple months at the very least. So a fundraiser, you can do one main project, have the focus on that, the money is for that only, and so it's a little more streamlined. Um, but the cons are you have to be promoting the fundraiser a lot, and then you have to come up with ways to promote it, because if you're just promoting something like a Patreon or one-time donations, which I'll sort of weave in also, if you're just promoting, you know, stuff like that, then it's a little bit easier to continue promoting however you're trying to fundraise because you're putting out content regularly. It's like if you're making a video every week, you mention the fundraiser in every video, and then you've worked in that promotion of your money stuff. But for something like a big fundraiser that only wants like one large sum of money, how are you going to promote that on a regular basis if you just keep sharing the same link and saying the same blurb about the project no one's going to care and you're going to start to annoy all the people following you so you kind of have to come up with creative ways to continue to promote the fundraiser um i think what laura and i did for our album was we recorded some videos that were sort of promoting the fundraiser um so you have to still put in the work that's why I like things like Patreon, even though they're a slower burn in the beginning, because um, it, you can kind of go at your own pace. As you make more videos, you start to earn more money. A fundraiser is kind of a lot of pressure. You know, usually you're trying to raise at least a thousand dollars if you're doing a major project, and it's a lot of pressure to try to raise that money. So um, that's why something like I'll just segue into my third point, which is just accepting donations, which of course I do here on the stream with these links. And sorry, I realize every time I click back to the video, I'm kind of like looking all over the place. I wasn't sure. I'm, I'm out of my element in this different setup. Um, but, uh, so yeah, accepting one-time donations like I do here on the live stream, and I'm trying to think of other times that I've done it. I think I've mostly just done it for the live events, kind of to make it like a virtual tip jar or something, since it's, you know, somewhat common to perform and have people give you a tip or two. So I always make that available and like I've been able to set it up like you can get your own if you have a PayPal account you can get your own little PayPal link like I have there obviously Venmo is a little more personal but it is you know possible for anyone to send money there. So accepting donations is a great way to do it too it's just like anything it's not super reliable you never really know how it's going to go but you can uh, continue to put your content out with the donation thing and sort of see which things get more response. 
Um, but again, it goes back to audience building, and I think they accept, you know, accepting donations, in theory, it's great, because you can just show up and someone, and then you get tips for it, but I don't believe that I would have been able to just get random donations if I hadn't built something first, if I hadn't created this whole channel, this whole platform, my outreach, my education. I don't think I would be getting donations the way that I do if it weren't for the foundation that I had created for this whole project. So that's just something to keep in mind too, that asking for donations doesn't automatically mean free money. Um, there kind of needs to be some sort of foundation behind it. So those are kind of my main three. And I know there's a lot of other things, like there's coffee spelled the K-K-O, and I think it has a dash in the link, but you can Google it, K-O-F-I, and it's like popular for giving money to creators. It's like buy me a coffee, you know, just send someone five bucks or something. It's kind of a cool idea. I've never used it myself. I like to keep it simple with just, if you're gonna donate to me, here's a very simple link and donate whatever you want to donate and there's no pressure or don't donate if you don't want to donate and I prefer to just kind of keep it simple like that. And like I've said before, my Patreon is what I rely on. You know, if I was relying on donations, I don't know, I mean, there's busking. This is basically asking for donations online is virtual busking. So if anyone has experience with real live busking, then you probably know a little bit what it's like showing up and, you know, every day is going to be different with what you walk home with. Um, but for the internet, of course, you've got to create your own audience unless you're getting featured on someone else's platform. Whereas if you're busking, you don't really have to create that audience. You get to just go to a location where there's already an audience. So it really does all come back to audience building and community building because, again, those are going to be the people who donate to you. Um, Sometimes we find our audience through asking for donations, um, like maybe we're putting ourselves out there with some sort of performance or some sort of topic, and then we're also asking for money, so maybe it gets shared around a bit more and then someone finds us through that. That is possible. Um, but I really would say that the bottom line is providing value. I know for me and this channel, um, the educational videos are definitely I actually have not looked at the stats, but I'm pretty sure that educational videos are the most popular videos on my channel. And it's just good for me to know that that's, that's an important value that I'm providing. For me personally, even though I do a lot of teaching and I think teaching is great, obviously, um, it's never something that I actually had to cultivate in any way. Teaching is very natural for me. I get accused of being condescending a lot. Not a lot, but like I can sound condescending because I just am such a teacher. I just talk like I'm teaching everybody that I talk to. It's just, it's just who I am. Um, so teaching for me is never something I had to work that hard at. It just came very naturally. So I put it up on YouTube just to add more stuff. And then I was like, oh, wow, people are really responding to my teaching. And that showed me that I should make more teaching videos, even though, especially when I was building my channel five years ago, I just wanted to do performance videos. I just wanted to play repertoire, maybe talk about it a little bit, but I mostly just wanted to play repertoire. But I listened to my audience and I considered my value and what I am offering that is of value to other people. And I saw very clearly that education was a part of that. So I just made a point to make educational stuff really intertwined with all my other work. Granted, when you're a historical performer, everything is educational anyway, but to have videos that were just specifically on teaching topics where I wasn't even really playing except to demonstrate, um, you know, that, that was something I had to do based on seeing the response from people. So that's why it's so important to listen to what people are saying or pay attention to the things that perform well. There's always going to be a certain amount of randomness involved, but you can still learn a lot by seeing how people respond. Um, Okay, what is your experience or thoughts about with collaborations? I'm thinking about the financial arrangements if there are any. So I'm not sure if you're asking like my specific take on collaborations, like what I do or just what I think about them big picture. There's a lot to say. Um, so for me personally, I've been featuring other people on the channel and I do call those people collaborators because they are collaborating with me. Um, but I'm not playing in the videos, so I'm sure you guys have seen on my channel that I've featured other musicians who are playing early in classical music. So 
they are a collaborator of sorts, but they're not, we're not like creating something together. They're creating something that I'm showcasing. Um, cause I'm not taking on any more collaborations for myself just because I'm so oversaturated with the amount of stuff that I'm doing because I have my other non-classical music project, which is taking up pretty much most of my time and then just delivering every week on these live streams and staying on top of, I have various brand partnerships and things that I do, um, as Emily plays cello. So I am like completely at capacity personally for collaborations, but they're a very important part. I mean to like, but I mean it, they're a very important part of getting started. I've did a lot of collaborations in my earlier years. Plenty of them are still on my channel and many of these are virtual collaborations because when you do a collaboration with someone and you both agree to share the video or maybe they agree to share it on their platforms because they have more followers or whatever, however you decide to share the content, you now have access to all of those people's followers and subscribers. So it's a really great way to get discovered and get more people to see what you're doing and what you're up to, uh, which is so important. If you're trying to build your audience, you need to be working with other people and reaching out to all these other different circles. The, there is an infinite world out there. There are infinite, there are how many people on this planet? There are so many people. There are enough people out there who would be interested in your music. You just have to find them and finding them is the hardest part. So usually tapping into other people's connections and networks through collaboration is one of the best ways to do that. And then of course, collaboration has its other benefits. We just always learn when we collaborate with other people. So. Basically, my answer is that I am no longer doing collaborations um, beyond like, like I mentioned, I'm doing something with Laura. Like I have, I'm doing that as sort of like, she's coming on for my own work as opposed to me taking on an additional thing with somebody else. Um, but collaboration is really important, especially in the beginning. So I would recommend it. Uh, Matthew says the educational aspect of your videos was an early draw for me. Thank you. And I do think a lot of people decided to pledge to my Patreon and stuff like that for the educational stuff. So yeah, that kind of definitely goes along with that. Quick question. Uh, how do you plan your YouTube videos, Patreon? Do you plan a social media calendar with a monthly schedule? Do you go with the flow and audience requests? Yeah. So it's evolved over the years. So I've said a million times now I've had my Patreon and my regular videos usually I will say between two to four videos a month um, for the last five years. So I've spent a long time with that kind of production schedule for the YouTube channel. And um, when I was doing pre-recorded videos, like I had to learn the repertoire, practice, do the filming, do the editing. Sometimes they were multi-parts. Those took a lot of work and I had to ahead of time pick out the piece I was going to do, make sure I had at least some time to practice it. And then of course, carve out however many hours I was going to need to do the filming, the editing. I really had to know, I mean, I did it kind of like loosey goosey, but I knew like, all right, I need this day to edit. I need this day to record. Um, I'm going to play this piece. I got to make sure I practice it on the weekend. Like just little stuff like that. I always had to plan. Um, so, but I always kind of go with my gut to an extent, like, in terms of choosing stuff, it was always stuff I wanted to do and felt moved to do. Sometimes it would be strategy like, oh, you know, Vivaldi sonatas are really popular. I should probably record a Vivaldi sonata. But I always kind of go with my own inspiration because if you have to have a lot of creative output, it can be really taxing if you're just pressuring on yourself to come up with stuff all the time. So what I prefer to do as a, just like a naturally creative person is let the ideas come to me and just make a point to like write it down or commit to it when I get the idea. And then when it comes time to figure out what I'm doing, I've got this list of ideas that I've already kind of put together. So it definitely does require advanced planning and thinking about it. Um, so I would say when I was really on it, recording videos four times a month, I had to kind of plan ahead what I was doing. When I started doing fewer videos, I was able to be a little bit more spontaneous and I always had room for some spontaneity just because sometimes it's actually just easier for me to do things spur of the moment than it is to stress about planning. Like I found for myself personally that sometimes if I just wait till not the last minute, but close to the last minute, the great idea will come, the energy will be there and I'll be able to do it. But if I obsess too early and I regiment myself, I just get frustrated in the process and then I don't even want to do it. So 
for me, I have to work in some spontaneity, but um, I needed to have a certain amount of planning or else it just wouldn't get done. Um, and I love taking into account audience requests. I have gotten some that I've done, but I get plenty of requests that I don't do. You know, it's all for me. Uh, it has to really work for me for a lot of reasons. I have to feel like it's something that I can play well, or it's a topic I can talk about, you know, with confidence or whatever it is. It's got to work for me, but there have been some great audience suggestions that I have done. Um, so, oh, Guero's here. Hey. Well, we're almost wrapping up. We're down to our uh, last how did I become good at talking to an audience? So this, unfortunately, goes along with my teaching thing, which I was just earlier talking about how teaching is really natural to me, like to the extent that I sound like I'm teaching people when I probably shouldn't sound like that. It makes me sound like I'm a snob. <laughs> Sorry to everyone who has to be subjected to that, but that's just how I talk. Um, and the same thing is the same thing is true of public speaking. It's just always been really natural for me. And it is a blessing, but I will say being good at the cello was not natural for me. So I'm very blessed in my public speaking and my educational skills, but I had to work really hard to be good at the cello. Like I was not, I was good for like a regular kid in public school. And like, I've definitely always been musical and creative and artistic, but I started private lessons on the cello really late and had to do a lot of catching up and I had really bad technique and I didn't have a good teacher when I started my undergrad. So like playing the cello did not come easy. I had to really work at that, but public speaking and teaching are just very natural for me. Um, and probably a lot of people probably would have advised me at some point to like, just be a teacher, which is what they tell every classical musician who they think is not good enough to be a professional performer and just be a teacher. And I'm sure I was given that advice, but I knew in my heart, like, that's not all that I am. Like, just because I have to work a little harder to get good at the cello, I have my whole life ahead of me. Like, this was me at 18 um, or 20. It was like, I have my whole life ahead of me to get better at the cello. How dare you tell me throw it in the trash and just be a teacher? Like, I want to play the cello. So I had to work in those areas. And I knew that my teaching skills and my talking skills would help ride me along as I got better and better and better at cello. I had some skills that were natural to me to carry me. And um, I think that's a really important thing for everybody to consider because everybody has something that they're naturally good at that uh, serves their career. So embrace those skills. Like for me, the talking and the public speaking, especially once I was professional, I talked at all my concerts, like audience talk, whether I was talking about the repertoire or the group, usually it was the repertoire because it was all classical music. But I made a point to always, always talk to my audiences because I knew I was good at that. And I knew that even if I didn't play as in tune as some other player, that the fact that I had talked to the audience and I had connected with them and I had told them something special about the music, they were going to remember that a lot more than me being a little out of tune in a spot. Now, an audition jury wouldn't, but that's why that whole system is garbage, in my opinion. Because none of that stuff matters the way people act like it does. But um, that's a different soapbox rant for a different day. Um, so use whatever skills are natural for you. If you're naturally just really great at your instrument and like you just sound awesome, then like play hard, show offy stuff or make sure that you get to really shine in all your performances if you're just a really strong player who always sounds awesome. And if you're not a great speaker, have someone else in the ensemble be the speaker and you can work up to it. But yeah, just for me, um, talking is just very natural. One time in high school, I had to read my English essay on, I wish I could remember what this paper was on. It was some like research paper, but we had to read it out loud to the class. So I got up to the little podium by the teacher's desk and this was like 10th grade. Um, so I was like probably 15 and I just read my paper, like did my good performance of reading my research paper to the class. And later there were kids in my class who were like, how did you do that? We were all like, how is she reading her paper but looking up at the same time? <laughs> but it's like, talking for me is so natural that I could just like glance at the paper and read and talk and look up. So um, I definitely feel blessed to have the communication skills. I mean, people don't always love what I say, but people will never love. People are always gonna have their opinions. You gotta say what's true to you. Um, 
Are you aware of Two Set Violin? Um, do you have an opinion about their content approach and journey? So yes, um, I wouldn't say I'm like a super fan. I haven't like watched a ton of their stuff, but I've definitely seen enough of Two Set to know what they're about. And I think it's cool. I don't necessarily agree. You know, they're very much like totally classically trained dudes. I think they went to Juilliard, both of them, or at least one of them. So they're very like traditional, but they're making it funny and accessible, which is great. But I can see for myself that they definitely have certain mindsets that are very traditional, of still, still very in line with the classical music values, which is not a bad thing. I just sometimes I see a contrast in myself to that. But um, honestly, anything that anyone is doing that is bringing people, bringing classical music to the masses, I support it. You know, I don't have any snob filters. Like, that's not good enough. That shouldn't be this. It's so stupid that people this. If people are watching it and enjoying it and it's connecting them with music and especially classical music, I support it. Um, so I think it's great, especially because they're very successful and that's nice to see. It's nice to see classical music role models out there being themselves, expressing themselves, having fun, and just kind of showing the classical music world to the rest of the world. Um, so I support them. Are you proud of where you are in your car ear? <laughs> I'm sure you mean career. And yeah, I am, I am very happy and I feel... I don't know if I would say lucky exactly, we all have luck in our own ways, but I'm very happy during a time that has been so difficult with the pandemic and my sympathies go out to everybody who's had their life turned upside down by this whole thing. I had been moving away from live performance for the last two years, actually. And some people know that because when I moved to Los Angeles, my career did change a lot from when I was in Boston. That was uh, 2017 that I moved here. I had a very active gig life in Boston. I mean, I did a decent amount of teaching also, but I was playing concerts with my string quartet. I had done solo concerts. I was traveling for concerts. I was playing concerts all the time. But when I moved to LA, um, I didn't like lock in with anybody who could hire me right away. And there's not as much early music going on. And I was not really getting gigs because I just, I was in a new city. It takes a long time. It took me seven years in Boston to build up all my connections. So I really switched to even more online stuff. Like I had been doing online stuff before I moved out here, but once I got here and it seemed like, I don't know how long it's gonna take for me to start getting gigs, I just started focusing on more online stuff. Um, and then of course I found in my other music project. So when this whole thing happened that suddenly gigs and concerts aren't a thing it actually didn't have much effect on me because i had been sort of moving away from gig life anyway um so that actually was a blessing to feel like all this investment that i put into youtube into my instagram into these online ways of doing things suddenly had more value than ever. I mean, I already knew it had value because it's grown so much over the years. It's financially supported me, especially between the fundraisers that I've done, the albums I've sold, my Patreon, my YouTube channel. Like I have been so supported by the internet and by my online stuff in some ways more than gigs. So it was kind of, it's bittersweet because I'm sorry that so many people who've been playing amazing concerts now cannot do that for a while. But for myself personally, it was validating that I invested in the right area because I have something that a pandemic can't take away. So that gave me a certain amount of career satisfaction and some choice validation, I guess I would say. Um, but in terms of the, even before the pandemic, which I know is the only thing anyone talks about anymore, I was very satisfied with my career because I had a couple bucket list things when I set out to be a Baroque, and not even a Baroque cellist, when I set out to be a professional cellist. And I pretty much crossed them all off. A big one was a professional string quartet, which I had emergence quartet for three years in Boston. We did some amazing stuff and we were an all girl string quartet, not intentionally, but that's just how it ended up. And the other three girls were, you know, it was such a great team that we had. Everybody had such a special skill they brought to the table and it really made our quartet go far. Literally, we flew across the country for concerts and stuff, and then we also just had some amazing experiences. So that was a big one. I've got to record solo albums. I've done many solo recitals. Uh, I just have done some 
awesome stuff in my career. I'm so thankful for it. And sometimes I think back to the college days and now we're like totally on a tangent, but it's cool. This is my channel. I can do what I want. <laughs> but I look back at the college days like, am I ever going to be able to make this work? And all my teachers are acting like, what are you going to do with yourself? And like, I had such an amazing career. It's just like so unfortunate that it's good to be realistic, but there's a way to be realistic and proactive and find creative solutions to problems. And then there's a way to be realistic that's just a downer and dismal and depressing. So when you're trying to give someone helpful advice or even you're talking to yourself about the state of your career, keep that in mind that there's a way to be realistic that helps and there's a way to be re realistic that can kind of hurt. So um, I guess we'll start to get to the wrapping up now. It's been an hour. So again, we went over a couple different ways that you can monetize classical music. The most important thing, as I'll say again, is audience building, community building, creating a group of people who might want to donate to you, even if they're not donating yet. And um, getting over the hump of sharing yourself, which is something I constantly talk about, but that's the biggest barrier because what's going to get you those followers, those subscribers, those people who want to give you money, is putting stuff out there for them to enjoy. You can't expect money for existing. I'm a great cellist. I recorded this one video where I sound perfect. Don't you want to give me money now? It's like, no, you got to show up regularly and, and keep making stuff and keep sharing yourself and keep growing and allow people to be a part of your process. Like my early YouTube videos, I mean, a lot, some of them, plenty of them, I unlisted them eventually when I felt like, ah, oh, this video is not that good and I have like better ones now to fill those gaps. But um, I definitely grew up on this channel. Sometimes I think about how I could take like all my videos from like 2015 or 2016 and re-record them now and probably sound way better. But I accept that I grew up on this channel and that, uh, that people supported me along the way and those videos got me here. Even if I could record a better video today, those videos were still a part of my path. Um, so that's just my personal approach and it has worked for me and I believe it can work for other people too. I've seen it work for other people. So I really do encourage people to open yourself up to a new way of existing and really do consider some of the not so obvious things. Like, yes, you can Put a fundraiser link, like I have fundraiser links. Yes, you can do that. Yes, you can have a Patreon, but it's not just about setting up a Patreon. It's not just about asking for donations. It's about your approach to your audience, your building of your audience, and the value that you provide for others. So I really think that that should be the takeaway. Um, so yeah. Um, bye, Bill. Thank you for your super chat and thank you guys all for the kind words. So I'll give it like a minute if anyone has a final question and then we will wrap up for today's live stream. And seem like construction noise was not that bad today. I don't know what I'm going to do about the next coming weeks with the construction. I got to figure that out. But I always announce everything on my Instagram like the day of. So be following me, Emily Plays Cello, on Instagram if you want to know for sure. Also my Facebook page, which is Emily Plays Cello like facebook.com slash Emily plays cello. Um, that also has the announcements of whatever's going on. So thank you all for being here. Said I'm going to wait one more minute. <laughs> Updates on Animal Crossing. Still not playing Animal Crossing as much as I would like. It's just the problem of being a busy freelancer is just never enough time to just sit and chill. Also because I have a lot of friends who've been playing and, you know, the game came out basically when lockdown began. So like many people binged for hours and made these incredible islands and I'm like so not even close because I don't have enough time to play video games. But a little bit at a time. I said I'll have my ideal Animal Crossing Island by the end of the year is my goal, because that's realistic, as we talked about, so. All right, guys, so it seems like there's not really any more questions, so we will wrap up for today. I look forward to seeing you next week on the live stream. Let's just do my, what else do I have to say? If you play classical or early or Baroque music and you want to be featured, as we talked about, collabs and building community a great way to build your community is getting featured on another person's channel or account it definitely helped me when i was growing um 
I have gotten shares from that viola kid on Instagram was really what launched my Instagram growing really fast. Um, I have gotten features from Classic FM on Facebook, which got me a lot of Facebook likes. So we really do need to tap into other people's followings if we want to grow our own. So that's why I love to feature people that I think are doing great work on my YouTube channel to kind of spread the wealth. So if you play a classical instrument, even better if you play a period instrument, consider submitting to my channel. You can go to my website, emilyplacecello.com slash collaborators and fill out a little simple form. I can help you with the video and editing and stuff. Um, or if you just have some questions, we can talk about them. So definitely consider applying for that. And another thing, if you're looking to grow what you're doing um, on online platforms is check out my audio mixing tutorial, which I made for beginner, beginner, beginners who just have GarageBand because it's free with all Apple computers. It just shows a very basic way to do some simple audio treatment to your recordings in GarageBand to make them sound nice. So you don't have to rely on being in a good sounding room. You can actually record in a very dry room, like a practice room or a small crowded room and make it sound really good just using GarageBand. So that tutorial is also on my website. It is emilyplacecello.com slash tutorials is where you'll find that. Um, and I guess that's it. You can check out my Patreon that I talked about a lot in this at patreon.com slash emilyplacecello. And I guess that's all for today. So thank you guys so much for watching. If you're watching the archive, feel free to leave questions in the comments. And uh, I will see you all when I see you, probably next week. All right, bye guys.